October 4th, 1967. Something unusual is happening in the skies over the Canadian province of Nova Scotia. During the waning hours of the evening, dozens of people are confounded by a series of inexplicable lights in the sky. It's a date that will later become known as the night of the UFOs. It was a clear night, the stars were out. It was a cold night, there was a light wind. A beautiful night, starlight. The night of October the 4th, 67, stuck with me for several reasons and perhaps primary is the principle the scene is believing. At 10 p.m. in the town of Dartmouth, 12-year-old Chris Stiles is getting ready for bed and takes one last look out his bedroom window. He is dumbfounded at what he sees. I saw a strange orange light that was moving along the shoreline and it was like nothing I'd ever seen. It was dim and hard to discern any detail. So I quickly grabbed my jacket, ran out the front door, and went down to the waterfront to get a better look. A quick sprint past the warehouses brings Stiles face to face with the mysterious apparition. When I got to the waterfront, what I saw was a strange orange sphere, perhaps 60 feet through. And it was the color of an iron poker when it first glows in a fireplace if you let it get hot long enough. It was hovering, following the shoreline, perhaps 10 feet over the water. It made no sound. I was quite fearful and after a time ran from the scene. The object drifts across the harbor as Stiles flees the area. But the initial shock leaves an indelible impression. I knew in my life, at 12 for the first time, what real fear was. Stiles' encounter with the UFO is only the prelude to a flurry of sightings that explode throughout Nova Scotia that night. One hour later, the small fishing village of Shag Harbor on the southern tip of the peninsula begins to erupt with similar sightings. 18-year-old fisherman Lori Wickens is driving home with three friends when something odd in the sky catches his attention. We were on our way to Woods Harbor, and through Shag Harbor, just past the post office, we happened to look out through the window and we see a light, and there was two on, then three on, then there was four on, it seemed to be flying along like just level, a yellowish orange color, I guess the color of the lights was. Racing west along Highway 3, Wickens attempts to keep the strange lights in view, but the noiseless objects begin descending at a 45 degree angle and drop below the tree line. Seemed to be going along with us, and then when we got to the bottom of the hill, we lost sight of it. A few miles away, 18-year-old Norman Smith is riding home with a friend through Bear Point Woods and sees something similar in the sky. We were chasing the girls and uh, we were coming on our way home and when we noticed, first noticed the lights in the sky. The sight of the strange illuminated shapes is enough to make them pull over and watch. We stopped alongside the road. I got out, was looking at the lights. It was stopped in midair. There was five lights. The lowest light to the ground was like if you were looking at a full moon. And then the next one just kept getting smaller. The next one smaller. There was no sound. You couldn't hear anything. Smith gazes at the lights for a few moments as curiosity grows into unsettling concern. I know I was frightened because I didn't know what it was. Never seen lights like that before in, in my life. Down the road, Lori Wickens and his friends are still in hot pursuit of the strange object. They suddenly see a bright flash and hear a whistling sound like a falling bomb. They believe it may be falling into the harbor, so they speed toward the waterfront. The minute we come over the top of the hill, we could see the light in the water. At the time, we thought it was plain. Wickens pulls into a vacant parking lot by the shore to get a better look. The light we see in the harbor looked like a half a globe a yellowish color light we could see it drifting down the harbor that was the first thing coming to mind is go call the RCMP and report that we'd seen a plane crash because that's what we thought it was Wickens returns to his car races to the nearest payphone and calls the regional headquarters of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police the country's national police force it is known throughout Canada as the RCMP the corporal on duty answers the call at 11.25 and hears Wickens' excited voice. 
I only just wanted to know what we was drinking. And we said we wasn't drinking and wanted to know the number for the phone booth. After listening to Wiccan's story, the RCMP officer on duty is skeptical. But as soon as he hangs up, other calls start pouring in. The calls come in from nearby Bear Point, Cape Sable Island, and Maggie Garren's Point, all reporting the same thing. With so many witnesses, the RCMP has no choice but to take this seriously. We got in the car to leave, and, that's, and then he called by and wanted to know where he could meet us so we could see it in the water. And I told him we'd be by the moss plant because that's where it was, right off of there. Meanwhile, eyewitness Norman Smith is also busy alerting people about the mysterious object above the harbor. We drove up to my father's place and I ran in the house, got my father, and he came out door. We stood looking at the lights in the sky and it wasn't too long, probably a couple of minutes, when we see the police car coming and its red lights flashing. Smith follows the speeding police cruiser to a shoreside parking lot where a crowd of witnesses has gathered. When we got there, there was, I think, 16 people, including the police officers. And uh, they were local, local people. They all seen the lights come down to the ground and, and they watched it land in the water. Civilians and the RCMP officers on the scene observed the dull yellow-orange light drifting 300 yards from shore. It was totally dark. All you could see was the lights, and it was on the water. We watched the light for probably 10 minutes as it was drifting down the harbor. We walked to the top of the hill, and then the light just went out. It just disappeared. Everyone is convinced that they have just witnessed a plane crash. At 11.38 p.m., one of the officers puts a call through to the Rescue Coordination Center in Halifax, the branch of the Canadian military that organizes search and rescue operations. The Coast Guard cutter in nearby Clarks Harbor is also contacted. Lighthouse keepers in the surrounding areas are put on alert. I was on duty, just carrying out my regular surveillance of uh, navigational aids. Somewhere around midnight when I first got a call that they were searching for something that crashed in the harbor. Meanwhile, the RCMP officers improvise their own rescue operation. They begin contacting local fishermen to commandeer boats to go out to the impact site. As word gets out, local residents spring into action. Someone came to our door, and my husband jumped up and went to the, went to the door to see who was there. And it was a policeman. And he said that uh, something had come down in the harbor, and that they thought it was a plane. And that they knew that his boat was at the wharf, and he could get there in a hurry. I was on my way home from babysitting, where I was uh, picked up by a local resident there. He had some urgency in his voice when he said, "We've got, you've got to go with me, because we've got to go search for possible survivors of a plane crash or something of that nature. We really didn't know what we were heading out for. All we could do was try to get there as fast as we could, and we were rushing. We went down to the wharf, untied the lines, and got the boats clear, and we left there as fast as we could to get to the area. It's now slightly before midnight. Two fishing boats with several volunteers motor out towards open water at full throttle. Crisscrossing patterns of searchlight beams paint the dark, still waters of the harbor as the search begins. And what we were doing was looking for something on the water, debris, is what we were thinking. The mood on the boats is tense as the would-be rescuers brace themselves for a grisly scene of floating body parts and plane wreckage. What they actually encounter is even more bizarre. We came into this foam on the water it was like orange foam that was on the water, like bubbly foam. Quite a long streak of it. It was just more or less floating on the water. What it was, I don't know. The fishermen realize that the mysterious foam is connected to whatever crashed into the harbor. Norman Smith attempts to get a sample of the peculiar substance. We circled the boat around. We came back into the foam. When we came back into it, I took a, a small dip net and uh, dipped the dip net down into the water, right into the foam. 
When I pulled the dip net up out of the phone, there was nothing. You couldn't see nothing, totally nothing on the dip net. I've been fishing all my life and I've never ever seen anything like that. I've been up rivers and on lakes and out on the ocean and never ever see foam like that on the water. The strange foam soon melts back into the dark water. But even more puzzling than the foam is the lack of any debris at the site. If something has just crashed into Shag Harbor, it seems to have completely vanished. We had thought it, whatever it was, it just sunk. And I was, like you, kind of expecting to find some debris, but there was nothing. We were out there pretty near all night and circling around and looking for anything else that was on the water, any debris or anything, and we never found nothing. There was not so much as a tin can. The confusion among the fishermen in Shag Harbor is shared by the individuals back at the Rescue Coordination Center in Halifax. The RCC checks with the Air Traffic Control Center in Moncton, New Brunswick, and the NORAD Control Center in North Bay, Ontario, to determine whether any civilian commercial or military aircraft is missing. The reports of an aircraft crashing into Shag Harbor do not mesh with the data they get back. They realize that this is not a downed aircraft, none are missing. They're looking for something unconventional. They're starting to realize that perhaps this is some unknown object from space. The residents are certain that something fell into the dark waters of Shag Harbor. But no one seems to know what it is. Shag Harbor is a small, unassuming fishing village on the southwestern tip of Nova Scotia. It's so inconspicuous that it does not appear on some maps. That is all about to change on October 4th, 1967. Several local residents report what they believe to be a plane crashing into the harbor. The sightings begin a chain of events that will make headlines around the world. Within hours of the initial reports, local fishermen, police officers, and the Coast Guard scour the waters of the harbor throughout the night, but find no wreckage or debris. As the sun rises the next day, the community is gripped by apprehension and uncertainty. I think everybody that night had the feeling that they were keeping something from us. Word quickly circulates that no debris has been found. With no information coming from the authorities, speculation spreads like wildfire. It was the talk of the community, you know, and there was a UFO, and of course, like everybody else, we wondered, I guess, what, what it could be. People became fearful. They were, uh, they were wondering, would there be more? Would they tangle in our nests? Would it crash in our house? What's going on here? and uh, they just weren't getting answers. Finally, the Rescue Coordination Center issues a statement that rules out the possibility of a plane crash. At 10.20 a.m. on October 5th, the center sends a telex stamped priority to the Canadian Forces Headquarters in Ottawa. The message outlines the sightings by the Shag Harbor residents and the RCMP officers. It refers to the thing in Shag Harbor as a dark object. More important, it labels the object in question as a UFO. It's unique also in that, again, the term UFO is first used by the authorities who are searching and not by the eyewitnesses. By the evening of October 5th, the Shag Harbor incident has become a military matter. After reviewing the telex from the Rescue Coordination Center, Squadron Leader William Bain sends an urgent message to the Canadian Maritime Command Canada's naval headquarters for the Atlantic coast. It advises an immediate underwater search of the area. If the mysterious dark object left nothing floating in the sea, perhaps the dive teams can find something below the surface. Maritime Command responds by dispatching a team of divers from the Navy's fleet diving unit in Halifax. They arrive on October 6th and begin diving off the deck of Coast Guard Cutter 101. You get all kinds of rumors in a small village like this. And then when the Navy shows up with divers and stuff, where you, you know that they must have took, taken it seriously because so many people saw the, the event in the sky. The divers section off an area of the harbor roughly one half mile long by one and a half miles wide. Well, they'd go over the side and start doing square searches. They'll pick an area uh, and normally uh, stake it off with a buoy on the bottom. The visibility in the waters off Nova Scotia, it's so full of plankton and so on. 
is usually quite limited, you know, maybe 20 feet at the most. It was a low-tech search, simply with handheld flashlights under the water. They wouldn't let us anywhere near that area. We were out there in the boat all right, but we had to stay back away from where they were diving. As the divers are scouring the depths of the harbor, the tiny fishing village is thrust into the media spotlight. On October 7th, a camera crew from the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation arrives and films the divers in action. This is actual footage from their news coverage. Canada's major newspapers have also gotten wind of the strange happenings. Among the first to jump on the breaking story is journalist Ray McLeod of Halifax's Chronicle Herald newspaper. I was one of the night reporters on duty at the Chronicle Herald uh, when the assignment editor just called me over and said there's a report of something going down in the harbor. A lot of people had seen it. Uh, CMP reported they'd seen it and the newspaper wanted to find out what had crashed. But when McLeod attempts to find out what went into the harbor, no one has any answers. I started following up on what we got from RCMP and what we got from Search and Rescue, and that was they had no idea what had gone down. Um, they had nothing missing. They had seen nothing drop off the radar screen anywhere in, in the area, and uh, they were basically puzzled. The lack of information surrounding the incident raises McLeod's curiosity and inspires him to launch his own investigation. Anytime you don't know, it, you know, it, it teases your imagination. You have to wonder uh, why they don't know. When the, all the armed forces and everyone was saying, we have no idea, we have no idea, we can't find anything, that's when I used one of my sources in the armed forces to get a number of someone in Ottawa. McLeod's source refers him to squadron leader William Bain at the air desk in Ottawa, a division of the Royal Canadian Air Force in charge of investigating UFO cases. Bain's response to the Shag Harbor incident is surprising. Just from what he'd heard so far, it looked like one of those few cases where there might be something concrete to the incident. And that, of course, was the quote that ended up in the headline of the paper. On October 7th, 1967, McLeod's article makes the front page of the ultra-conservative newspaper, The Chronicle Herald. McLeod is as surprised as anyone to see it there. And then the story came out, and my first reaction was, oh my God, what have I done? Okay, I never expected to see that screaming headline. It was a headline in two-inch red letters that looked more like something you would see in the National Enquirer. And that served to fuel, again, the rumor mill and the, the speculation. The shockwaves of McLeod's article reverberate throughout the Canadian province and reach the depths of Shag Harbor, where the underwater search is in progress. On October 7th, Maritime Command orders three additional divers to the impact site. As the dives continue, the people of Shag Harbor want answers. None are forthcoming. I guess there was a considerable amount of secrecy about the whole mission because they didn't reveal anything to us. Some people were told that they weren't allowed to speak about it. We thought that in a few days' time we were going to be hearing uh, yes, there was a plane that went down, it was on the bottom of the ocean, or whatever it was that they found. We thought that in a few days they were going to be telling us, but nobody ever did. Maritime Command terminates the underwater search on October 8th. They announced that three days of searching the harbor have yielded nil results. Five days after the sightings, the residents of Shag Harbor are no closer to understanding what crashed into the water the night of October 4th. But the end of the underwater search is just the beginning of a UFO case that is about to become even more perplexing. October 1967. After dozens of witnesses see something plunge into Shag Harbor on the southern tip of Nova Scotia, Local fishermen comb the waters looking for clues, and Navy divers search beneath the surface. But the Canadian Navy abruptly cancels the search with no explanation, leaving the people of Shag Harbor to wonder and worry. In a lot of our minds, it was a cover-up for something, but for them to spend that much time and effort and then give no explanation, it's like they were here today and gone tomorrow type of thing. With no one providing any answers, the rumor mill begins to churn. There was even a rumor at the time 
that that they had found something. We thought that there was times that they were bringing things up off of the off of the bottom of the ocean. The guy that had the divers in the area, he did admit that they did bring something up, wrapped underwater. It was wrapped underwater, but I guess that was kept for secret. Speculation was rampant, but speculation is always rampant when you don't give someone an explanation. During the 1960s, speculation about UFOs and other unexplained events often turns to the Cold War. The nuclear standoff between the United States and the Soviet Union is at its height. The two superpowers are constantly seeking to trump each other by harnessing the latest military technology. Top secret exercises are common in the North Atlantic. The heated atmosphere produces anxieties that intensify concerns about the incident. It was always in people's minds, and of course, you know, this is just a few years after the Cuban Missile Crisis and other things, so, you know, this, this added fuel to the fire. And then, of course, people start coming up with theories. Maybe it was a secret American device of some sort, a plane, a satellite that went, that went into the water. Or was it a Russian object? Night reporter Ray McLeod helps break the news about Shag Harbor by writing a front-page article in Halifax's Chronicle Herald newspaper. As McLeod prepares to follow up on the story, he receives some startling and discouraging news. There is a note on my typewriter to uh, see the managing editor. And I was told, don't follow up this story. We think this story should be handled by someone on day side because a lot of the contacts are easier to get in the day and we want to follow this up thoroughly. So uh, we've given the story to David Bentley. You're off the story. McLeod asserts that Bentley confers with scientists and academics to downplay the UFO angle. He pursued talking to, uh, talking to people who um, basically poo-pooed the story and told everybody there's nothing to it, it was all right. Among Bentley's chief sources is one of Canada's most outspoken UFO debunkers, an astronomer named Father Burke Gaffney. The late Father Michael Burke Gaffney was a Jesuit priest. He was an astronomer. He was a UFO skeptic. He took a very dim view of what the UFO phenomena possibly could be. And in statements of the press, he would downplay that interest. In a public lecture a few weeks after the Shag Harbor sightings, Burke Gaffney tries to alleviate any lingering concerns about what happened that night by arguing that 94% of all UFO sightings can be explained by meteorites, simple mirages, and other natural phenomena. With UFO skeptics having their say, McLeod begins to wonder what happened to squadron leader William Bain, the source of the Canadian military, quoted as saying that there might be something concrete to the Shag Harbor incident. I asked Bentley why he wasn't following up on uh, Squadron Leader Bain. And Bentley told me that uh, he was told the man didn't exist and there was no such office in Ottawa and to, to leave that angle in the story alone. Is the Chronicle Herald bowing to pressure from the Canadian government? McLeod ultimately realizes that the side of the story he began to pursue would never make it into the newspapers. I feel badly in some ways that I couldn't have used my talent and my contacts and my belief that the people have a right to know to keep plugging away until we found out what was going on. A journalist feels empty when they, when they have to do that, but then again, sometimes you have to do that. Soon, news of Canada's Shag Harbor sightings travels across the border and reaches renowned physicist Dr. Edward Condon and his team at the University of Colorado. Condon and his committee are working under a $500,000 contract from the United States Air Force and putting together an independent scientific assessment of unexplained UFO phenomena. The Condon report was striving together a certain amount of uh, case studies in other countries around the world internationally to see whether the United States Air Force should continue investigating reports of unidentified flying objects. And the Shag Harbor incident came to their attention. They have deep resources and a distinguished staff. But according to eyewitness Chris Stiles, Condon and his committee do not dedicate much time or effort to the puzzling Shag Harbor case. The case was turned over to an electrical engineer called Norman Levine. 
He made a few calls to RCMP headquarters in Ottawa and to Maritime Command, but was assured by them that they had done a complete and thorough search. It's unfortunate that he uh, didn't pursue that path because God knows what he would have found. Canada's Shag Harbor incident is one of 59 major UFO cases around the world that Condon's team selects to include in their study. They submit the final report to the Air Force on October 31st, 1968. But case number 34 receives only a few paragraphs in the 900-page tome. The report defends the lack of initiative in Shag Harbor by arguing no further investigation by the project was considered justifiable. This conclusion of the Shag Harbor case is consistent with Condon's overview of UFO research. Our general conclusion is that nothing has come from the study of UFOs in the past 21 years that has added to scientific knowledge. I think one of the things that happens when a serious scientific studies carrier to look at the UFO situation in specific cases, there's often a criteria that's very formal and rigid. And often what happens is the best cases somehow, no matter how you use your definitions, no matter how carefully you are, will slip through the cracks. I believe that's what happened to Shag Harbor. With no one pushing for answers, Canada's Shag Harbor incident becomes another unexplained mystery that is all but forgotten. It quickly faded from the headlines and became a back page story and a month later it would have been hard to find anything on it and people went home, made a sandwich, went to work, life went on. But 25 years later, a new investigation is launched into the Shag Harbor incident. This time some startling revelations make it clear that the book should never have been closed on this case. In October of 1967, over a dozen witnesses see a UFO plunge into Shag Harbor, Canada. 25 years later, unanswered questions remain. That's where it all took place. Where they, they, we knew that something came down out of the air and something landed in the water. But what it was, we didn't know. One of the other eyewitnesses that night cannot forget what he saw over the harbor. Chris Stiles had seen the UFO from his home in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. In 1992, while watching TV one night, everything would change. I had watched a, a rebroadcast of the Unsolved Mysteries episode that dealt with the uh, Roswell incident. And it made me think about Shag Harbor. And what I remembered and what was so tantalizing about Shag Harbor was that there was no denial that the authorities believed that this was a genuine UFO incident. And it had simply faded from memory. Stiles decides to launch his own investigation into Shag Harbor. He requests documents from the Canadian National Archives and the Department of National Defense using Canada's Access to Information Act. In a few weeks, the government documents arrive on spools of microfilm at the main branch of the Halifax Library. A tedious search begins. As you sit at the viewer and start going through document after document, uh, you realize that often these collections were compiled by bureaucrats who threw away nothing. The microfilm contains thousands of documents of UFO cases across Canada from 1965 to 1981. You're looking for an extraterrestrial straw in a terrestrial haystack. Stiles spends weeks at the microfilm viewer until he hits pay dirt. It was all there. Priority telexes from the Rescue Coordination Center to the Canadian Forces Headquarters. Instructions from the Canadian Maritime Command to the Atlantic Fleet Diving Unit. And reports by dozens of witnesses. Stiles realizes that he is looking at the biggest UFO event in Canada's history. And I only saw one that had UFO written on it with three big letters underlined three times. And that had to do with the Shag Harbor incident. I knew very early on that I had primary documents and a paper trail a mile wide here. Has Chris Stiles stumbled upon a Canadian government cover-up? Stiles decides he needs help. He contacts fellow UFO researcher Don Ledger to assist with his investigation. Chris Stiles was uh, very passionate about Shag Harbor. Uh, he'd been at it for about a year to a year and a half at that point, researching it, uh, digging out the uh, documents and so on. Um, and he he was infectious 
eventually dragged me into it as well. A careful examination of these declassified documents paints a vivid timeline of the events and helps bring the night of October 4th, 1967 back to life. I was very impressed with the uh, paper trail for the Shag Harbor incident. It just pretty much laid out the whole thing. For Stiles, the documents also suggest that the Canadian military knew more than they were telling. I think what surprised me most was how comfortable these military people seemed with the possibility that they might actually be looking for an object of extraterrestrial origin. In a sense, it was kind of an acknowledgement of UFO reality. Stiles uncovers documents that demonstrate that the sightings of October 4th were not confined to Shag Harbor alone. Reports came in from witnesses from all over Nova Scotia that night. He then comes across eyewitness testimony from an unexpected but extremely reliable source, experienced airline pilots. At 7.15 p.m. on October 4th, 1967, two pilots on Air Canada Flight 305 are flying at an altitude of 12,000 feet over southeastern Quebec. Captain Pierre Charbonneau and First Officer Robert Ralph glance out of the left cockpit window and see something astounding. What they saw that night was uh, a large, round, uh, colored object in the sky that uh, looked like, to them, like a kite with a tail on it. It was off their left wing and uh, just, uh, just slightly above their altitude. The experienced pilots are at a loss. They observe the strange shape for several minutes when suddenly they see a series of explosions. According to their testimony, they begin to take evasive action when the UFO disappears into a wisp of clouds. After some deliberation, the pilots decide to file official reports about the bizarre occurrence. It's not common for pilots to go on record and report a UFO, a um, particular commercial pilot, because of maybe some recrimination later on from his employers or maybe some uh, ridicule from his peers. Continuing his research, Stiles uncovers more information from an unexpected source. At St. Mary's University in Halifax, Stiles finds a treasure trove of X-Files collected by none other than the UFO skeptic who had downplayed the Shag Harbor incident in the press, Father Burke Gaffney. And an X-File is not just a secret file, but a file that is not admitted to by the originating agency. So it was great that they were there because there was no record of these in Ottawa, either at National Archives or RCMP headquarters. The RCMP X-Files collected by Burke Gaffney provide more telling details about the night of October 4th. One report includes the testimony of a ship captain named Leo Mercy. He's the captain of a fishing dragger that has 18 men. It's off the coast of San Bruno, Nova Scotia. And it's got four UFOs in the distance in a box pattern. And he looked at them, and then he went and he checked, and he found them on radar. But Mercy's report contains something even more puzzling, a reference to another underwater search near Shelburne, 31 miles northeast of Shag Harbor. His statement in this expo, he says, perhaps it's like the thing they're looking for down off Shelburne or off Shag Harbor. So this would seem that there was indeed a second simultaneous search effort. Did the UFO somehow travel away from Shag Harbor after it crashed? As it happens, the town of Shelburne is also home to a former Canadian military base. Is it somehow connected to the secrecy surrounding the Shag Harbor sightings? In fact, during the 1960s, the Shelburne facility was officially called an Oceanographic Institute, but its real identity was shrouded in Cold War intrigue. In its heyday, it served as a top-secret listening post to track Soviet submarine movements in the North Atlantic Ocean for the U.S. Navy. The Soviet submarine would come out in the Atlantic from Russia and go on its, on its tour. They would uh, pick up the, the engine noises and the hull sounds made by the submarine passing through the water on the microphones. This would be fed into a computer so they could get a match later on for if the same submarine came up. Could the Canadian authorities have used this submarine tracking technology to locate a submerged UFO? Was the Navy secretly searching the waters off Shelburne while all eyes were focused on Shag Harbor? 
To continue his investigation, Stiles sets out to track down those who would know best, the divers who actually probed the depths of Shag Harbor. On October 4, 1967, Chris Stiles was one of many witnesses who saw something strange in the skies over Nova Scotia. Now he is on the hunt to try to find out what it was. He has uncovered declassified government documents indicating that the Canadian military was involved in an intense search for a UFO that apparently crashed into Shag Harbor. The Canadian authorities assert that nothing was found, but Stiles begins to suspect that the divers may hold the key to the mystery. A number were unwilling to talk, but a few were. And they told a very interesting tale that went well beyond what was in the press clippings. April 9th, 1993. One of the divers agrees to an interview with Stiles, but demands that his identity be kept anonymous. Stiles is shocked when the diver informs him that they did indeed find something underwater, but it was not in Shag Harbor. He eventually explained that by the time divers had arrived in Shag Harbor, they knew the object was no longer there, that indeed it had come to rest on the seabed 25 miles away, off government point near the Shelburne base. Had the UFO eluded the search efforts at Shag Harbor by traveling underwater under its own power up the coast of Nova Scotia? If true, this would mean that the Canadian military conducted a secret search at Shelburne that was then concealed from the public. The diver's new revelation is confounding to Stiles. I found the Shelburne story very troubling. You know, there were a lot of things that were certain. We had government documents. But now there was a black box element to the case. And at first, I was very wary of it, very dubious of the claim. Now, Chris Stiles is wondering if the naval search at Shag Harbor was just an elaborate decoy for the real search the diver is now telling him about. When pressed for details, the diver's story becomes even more incredible. When the divers were dispatched to the Shelburne location, they dove over the object and found that indeed there was, in fact, even a second object there, which they described as lending assistance to the first. I didn't know what to make of this. This is well beyond events in the Shag Harbor incident. The diver informed Stiles that a flotilla of U.S. Navy and Canadian ships actually anchored over the two objects at Shelburne and monitored their activities. And as he said, when he dove, him and a partner, they were shocked to find there was still activity going on, and they indeed saw beings. They were on the bottom, and they watched what they thought was creatures from one object giving aid to the other object. The Canadian diver's story does not end there. He says that the Navy flotilla observed the two UFOs for seven days. Suddenly, the operation was interrupted by a Russian submarine crossing into Canadian territorial waters. At this critical juncture, the Navy ships were diverted to intercept the sub. They attempt to intercept the Soviet sub, trying to cut it off. And it's at this point, when they're doing this maneuver, that the two UFOs begin to move back toward the Gulf of Maine, and indeed, eventually, as reported, break the surface and fly away. Are there any witnesses on record that can corroborate the diver's fantastic story? Did anyone see these two UFOs leaving the waters off Shelburne? Perhaps. At 10 o'clock on October 11th, 1967, exactly one week after the Shag Harbor sightings, the mysterious lights in the sky were seen once again, this time by a family in Lower Woods Harbor, 35 miles from Shelburne. We look at what's known as the Lachlan Cameron sighting one week later, to the hour, and we see two sets of lights leaving the area of Shag Harbor and flying away. It fits the diver's story like a glove. It's hard to ignore that synchronicity. And we are left to wonder, did an alien spacecraft really crash into Shag Harbor as the Navy diver suggests? Or could there be another explanation? An important clue to that question may still exist if what one former lighthouse keeper says is true. The second day, I did find a cylinder. 
I knew it was something different, something I had never seen before. It was a cylinder type shape, oh, 30 inches, 30 to 40 inches long maybe, 15, 18 inches in diameter. Had been partially burned, wires protruding, uh, terrible odor. After finding the cylinder on the rocky shore of Bon Portage Island, Banks says he notified the Canadian Department of Transportation. They informed him to carefully pack the object and deliver it to an American naval officer at Prospect Point Wharf. It had to be something that they needed bad, wanted bad, because they flew, they flew him in from Virginia. Well, that's, that's just what he told me. But what was inside the cylinder that was so urgent and so secret? I was working for the federal government at the time and, and I, 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 don't, I don't really feel comfortable answering it. It's an ongoing mystery that continues to invite speculation. For some, the evidence points to the secret military experiments of the Cold War. There arose in my own mind that probably this was some kind of an experimental drone or something that they had back then. One of the first ones that they had that somehow got away from them. I think it was a surveillance type of thing, and it either crashed on its own or they crashed it. My opinion was still it was a plane, American military plane. Others contend that something capable of operating both above and below the water can only be extraterrestrial. Even now in this time of stealth aircraft, we still don't have anything that's both aerodynamic and hydrodynamic. What the object is, that's, that's what everybody always wants to know. What was the object? Uh, Whatever went into the harbor that night uh, was intelligently controlled and it was of extraterrestrial nature. It is unclear when, if ever, the complete set of military records will be released. If they are, will they shed light on this strange incident and maybe even settle once and for all what happened in Shag Harbor on October 4th, 1967? Until then, we are left with the mystery, speculation, and the fading memory of the people who saw something very unusual crash into the ocean that night. Today, I still scan the sky looking for something that might be different or something like what I've seen back 30 odd years ago. The only thing that I would like to know is what it was. <laughs>